full right to Job. He says to the three quick ideologists, quickly, to the three, like, maybe the name of one of them was, I don't know, one was Pat, the other was Jerry, who knows who was the third one, no. And he says, no, they, against that. So I think, again, that today, this pressure of meaning is strong. And now, my God, I will speak like a kind of a biblical preacher, but I mean it sincerely now, in the sense of uh, beware of succumbing to this pressure. I mean it seriously. This is where the devil waits upon you. This is paganism. Pagan universe, as all intelligent, not only Protestants, but Catholic also, like Chesterton pointed out. You know, this universal hermeneutic attitude, this metaphoric reading of the universe, this rose, that rose, cat is not a cat, it's devil, the dog is, you know, like this fullness of meaning. No, this is not Judeo-Christian legacy. Judeo-Christian legacy is much more bitter. You accept the meaninglessness of the universe. And today, again, it's a danger to succumb to this pseudo-hermeneutics when we witness things like AIDS, the prospect of ideological catastrophe, and so on. It's so simple to succumb to this temptation. AIDS, oh, it must have some meaning, punishment for this, ecology, yes, because we, we uh, disturbed the balance of yin-yang and so on or whatever. And no, you start with a little bit of hermeneutic of ecology, I warn you, you end up in Da Vinci Code, no, and then <laughs> you end up with Jesus Christ copulating, you know, it's a <laughs> small step from one to the other, no? Uh, so again, uh, one, has to, one has to resist this temptation, which is a terrible temptation. Let me give you a brutal, extreme example, which I not, not like, but it's at least convincing. When I was in Israel, I was told that there is a minor sect, but nonetheless not negligible, quite strong, sect of people, uh, and there is a rabbi who leads them, who believe that, among other things, that Holocaust was justified, that the Jewish people, European Jews, did something very sinful. Okay, he tries to specify it as integrating themselves too much into European societies, and that this was divine punishment. It's terrible, but I understand it in the sense that, you know, even if the message is a bad one, we deserved it. Often it's better a bad message than no message, because even if the message is bad, what you nonetheless gain is a dialogue with the meaningful universe. It still means things have a global meaning and so on and so on. So that's my first theoretical point. Let's go now on. Undoubtedly, at least some of you would, if you were, if we were to be immediately in a dialogue, would have reacted to what I've said, saying, but this is not what I directly or how I directly experienced the film. It's not open. Yes, and now I come to my second crucial point. The, the level at which this logic operates, this obscene, I claim, beliefs, it must have had a meaning, is not the level of our explicit beliefs. It's the level of, of what? I will describe this level now, briefly referring to what I developed in some of my books, namely, I would like, uh, in kind of case of professional solidarity, referring to a fi philosopher who three days ago lost his job, refer to a well-known contemporary American philosopher who elaborated the relationship between what we know and what we don't know. You got the point, sorry, old joke, Donald Trumpsfeld. No, I mean, <laughs> I'm referring to, you remember in March 2003, Donald Rumsfeld gave the famous interview where he developed his thoughts on the relationship between known and unknown. Here it is, the quote. <laughs> there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. That's clear. Some, like, I don't know. I'm here at Calvin College, and I know that I'm here. I know that I know that. Then he goes on. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. This is 
also clear. Like, I know there are some cars outside this building, but I don't know how many cars are parked there. And I know that I don't know this. That is to say, this is something that I don't know, but is still, how should I put it, with regard to the horizon of understanding or of meaning, it's still within the field of my knowledge. I clearly don't know that I know that. Then Rumsfeld goes on. This was, of course, destined at that point to warn us of unpredictable horrors hidden in Iraq. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know that we don't know. It's also clear. Let us say if Saddam were to have some ultra-secret weapon or whatever, not the ordinary weapons of mass destruction that we suspected that he had. This would be unknown unknowns. It's not simply that we didn't know. We even wouldn't have known that we don't know. No, because <laughs> it's totally outside our horizon. But here, unfortunately, the dialectical strength of Rumsfeld thinking, thinking finds its limit. Because did you notice that as, uh, the fourth term is missing. We have known knowns. We have uh, known unknowns. We know that we don't know. And we have unknown unknowns. It's so much outside our horizon that we even don't know that we don't know. What about the fourth term, which I claim is the most interesting one? Not the known unknowns, but the unknown knowns. Things we know, but we don't even know that we know them. That is to say, this is ideology. Ideology is not so much our explicit thesis. Today, of course, we live, as everybody says, in hedonist, uh, cynical era. Nobody is ready to fight for big causes. What I claim is that, nonetheless, there are more than ever, maybe, beliefs here, beliefs which, although we would never publicly admit that they are our beliefs, we as it were, practice these beliefs. They are embodied in our knowledge, in the materials we use, and so on, and so on. And to end up, to just make the last mention of poor Rumsfeld, I think that that's why he lost his job. <laughs> because he didn't know what he knows. OK, to put it in more consistent way, now I'm quite serious, why did things in Iraq go wrong? Precisely because American politics was not aware of its unknown knowns, of the implicit ideological prejudices, presuppositions, which they were simply here, not even you are aware of them, but they regulate your activity. You know, like presuppositions about how everybody in the world likes American type of democracy, presuppositions about how the people will react in Iraq, and so on, <clears throat> and so on, and so on. So this level is, I think, crucial for the functioning of ideology. All these things that, and this is the crucial problem of belief, I claim, all these things that we, in a way, believe without believing. If you, uh, I, in my book, The Parallax View, I developed more in detail. I will just mention it here. The wonderful example, which I found in a biography of Niels Bohr, you know, of Copenhagen quantum physics. Uh, uh, Niels Bohr, incidentally, was also the guy who, I think, provided a wonderful right answer to Einstein. You know that Einstein's well-known phrase, which reflects his distrust into, in uh, quantum physics, God doesn't play dice. Everybody knows this. But you know what was Niels Bohr's answer? Don't tell God what to do. I mean, I like <laughs> I mean, it's the correct. Okay. This is even a more beautiful story. Uh, a friend visited <coughs> Niels Bohr in a countryside house and noticed, noticed above the entrance door a horseshoe. Uh, in Europe, I don't know how it is here, a horseshoe is kind of a, a superstitious item. If you put it above the entrance, it is supposed to keep out the evil spirits and so on, keep the house safe, whatever. Now, the friend was shocked and addressed Niels Bohr, my God, I thought you were a scientist. Do you believe in this kind of superstitious crap? Uh, uh, Niels Bohr answered, no, of course not. I'm not crazy. Then the other guy says, but why is it there then? Ah, here Niels Bohr gave the correct answer. Not the usual boring, fake, multiculturalist, tolerant one that we like today. It's just our way of life. It is out of respect for and so on. No, I know this story. All my Jewish friends, they don't believe in 
they don't believe in uh, kosher food, but they don't eat pork out of respect for and so on. No, and you get here wonderful paradoxes. I mean, I'm not focusing on Jews with Arabs. It's the same with us Christians. That's, I'm saying because I know the situation there. No, like a typical Jew, of course, doesn't believe in God. But nonetheless, he believes that God gave them the land of Israel, that they can have it. That's another story, no? But what I want to say is, so what is then uh, the answer, not this politically correct, of Niels Bohr? Why do you have it? It's a wonderful one. He answered, uh, of course, I don't believe in it, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> That's ideology today. You don't have to believe in democracy. You practice it. Like, and your beliefs are out there in practice. Let me give you, let's go to the end here. It will be, as it's usual with me, I'm sorry if I offend some of you, an absolutely scatological, obscene end, end point. But I cannot resist repeating an old story that I often use. Uh, if you had the fortune of misfortune to travel around Europe, maybe you noticed how in what different way, now comes the dangerous point, toilets are structured in Europe. You have the French toilets where the hole where excrement disappears is in the back. So the idea is it drops, falls directly into it, it goes away as soon as possible. Then you have English or yours, Anglo-Saxon, where it floats in water. <laughs> then you have the German one which is the most obscene, of course, which is that the hole is in front, and you have just a little bit of water in the hole, so that most of the bowl is a kind of a plateau. The idea is your excrement falls there to enable, it's an old, disgusting German tradition that every morning you should inspect your bowl, sniff it, and so on, to see, look for any traces of illness. If you don't believe me, go and look. It's quite a <laughs> cultural shock. Now, I ask myself, why this? What's the point? Uh, I ask, I read books, there are two books on the market, if you, so you can check it, <laughs> on architect, very obscene books, on, they, you have scientific studies, uh, in what angle shit falls down, and, uh, 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 and uh, they don't give an account of this. They simply, eat every book that I know or text plays this simple utilitarian cards. Oh, how is that the other guys don't see that ours is the most utilitarian, the most practical? But then it strikes me. Of course, things are more 